here's here's how I, I understand this myself. I was a stripper for 20 years. I was in an environment where it's males and females, okay? Mm-hmm. Interacting, interacting. So in the dressing room, it's me talking to the women. In on the floor, it's me talking to the men. So I had a lot of interactions with men and women. A lot of people being very honest about themselves. There's something that I say on my live streams, which is sometimes I get guys who are like, ah, oh, you don't know men. You're not, you're not a man. Like, you can't speak for us. I'm like, dude, men don't go to therapists. They go to strippers and bartenders. <laughs> I know more about men than you do. I know more men than you've ever talked to. I sat on their laps and listened to what they said. And what I discovered... I am Canada's dating coach. Uh, I, 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 make, I make it so easy to remember, don't I? Yes. My name is Chantel High, but most people, you know, you hear Chantel High, you're not really going to retain that. But Canada's dating coach, my mission is to change and evolve the landscape of dating and relationships. It needs to change. When we look at today's high divorce rate, we go, it needs to change. When we look at how many couples are miserable, fighting while little eyes are watching them, things need to change because the next generation should be set up for success and not failure. Absolutely. I could not agree with you more. I feel like that is a big driving force for me and my practice too, is to help parents and people have better relationships because it does have a generational impact. I want teens, adolescents to have beautiful examples with their parents, no matter what their relationship looks like or who they're in. Mm-hmm. I want these kids to see an adult in their life, have a healthy, stable relationship and have that modeled for them so that they know what's possible for them one day. Monkey see, monkey do. Mm-hmm. If you mm-hmm. can see that you can achieve it. And, and that's part of the reason why I'm such a storyteller. Like in my books, in my platform, I love to tell stories. I love to illuminate what kind of relationship I have, where I've come from. If I can do it, you can do it. Girl, if I've been, listen, anger issues, you're looking at it, right? But you don't know you're looking at it because I've learned to become in control of my thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. And after being combative most of my life, because that's what I was taught. That's how I was raised. I've been gone seven years without a fight with my husband. Beautiful. I love that. I, I, I understand that energy. I've always kind of been the one that's been combative, especially with my dad. Um, and I did see a thing recently that was talking about oftentimes the, the person who is trying actually to be healthy can be the most combative because they're seeing unhealthy patterns, especially in family dynamics. Sometimes that can be where it comes from. So I'm trying to give myself credit and say, like, maybe that was it. Like, I didn't always have the best examples set forth for me in some regards. Some regards, I think my parents are still married and they're very much in love. We are very different people. But right. they, I did grow up seeing two parents who, yes, had their issues sometimes with communication, mostly over finances, but they kissed, they hugged, they always slept in the same bed. They said hello and goodbye. There was always a very strong love connection between them. So issues are not between us now as adults and how we function in the world. Like they gave me a very good example of what I did want in many ways in a relationship. Can I just say what I hear you talk about is foundational behaviors. Mm -hmm. Never taking away foundational behaviors. We might not be getting along right now right? We might be at odds at this particular point in our relationship for whatever reason, but foundational behaviors, which for me, like for you and your parents is the kissing, is the hugging, is the hello, it's the goodbyes. Well, guess what? So it is for me, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Even though, you know, I might be at odds with my husband, I'm still going to say, I love you. I might say, I still love you when I say I love you. And it's been a long time since I used the word still love you because it's been a long time since we had that level of conflict. Mm -hmm. But I started practicing this when we went from all these years of fighting, 10 years of fighting to seven years without a fight. And it was a shift in my behaviors that created that shift in the relationship, taking responsibility for my behaviors 
not only the toxic behaviors that I was doing, taking responsibility and ending those, but also taking responsibility for introducing healthy behaviors and maintaining them. And so those healthy behaviors, like you just described with your parents, like foundational behaviors, which is I say hello and goodbye. For me, five second kisses, right? Minimum two kisses a day, minimum five seconds each. So we got the hello, we got the goodbye with the kisses. I always say I love you with that hello and goodbye. And his acts, his love language is acts of service. So feeding mm -hmm. him is a loving act that he greatly appreciates. So bringing him his three meals a day is a foundational behavior that I do regardless of how I feel. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, can I just say, I yeah. said regardless of how I feel, and I know people are going to be like, oh, but what if he's abusive and you feel some kind of way about that? That's not what I'm talking about. Right. Never, never would I be with someone abusive. So that's not what I mean when I say regardless of how I feel. I might be having an ego moment mm -hmm. because I might not like what he pointed out in me and I might be rejecting that or he might be in an ego moment and I'm just giving him space to readjust and come back after processing and, and realizing that wasn't appropriate. He's going to come back. I'm going to let him have his thought process, go through his emotions, come back to where he should be. I will give him space while he's doing that. And I'm not going to withhold loving behaviors, the foundational behaviors, while either of us go through that process. I'm so glad that you said that. I think that is so important. Like, I, I do feel like I had to do some of that growing and understanding my process in between relationships. And it was for me, rather than you, know, you you got to learn that hard those hard lessons while in this long term relationships. I most likely had some relationships fail because I hadn't learned learned lessons. They had not learned lessons. Is what it is. Um, but I do see myself doing what you mentioned in trying to understand more about myself and trying to mitigate my thoughts and feelings before letting those things impact my partner. Yeah. And I. <laughs> We, we don't fight. We definitely have our disagreements about something, but we don't fight. Like I, we just don't raise our voices at one another. It's the healthiest level of communication that I have ever had. And it's amazing. And I love it. Yeah. I wish it for everyone. I really do. And, and I, while I am trying to coach people to have better levels of communication, I'm not just trying to tell them, Hey, do what I do. You know, it's, there are elements that everyone should do. Things like making sure that you're always leading with respect and love and things like that. But you, as I mentioned earlier, written several books mm -hmm. on the subject. Um, from dating, like I love your book, No More Assholes. Love, 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 love that. But you've also got things like After the First Kiss and Comeback Queen. So, you know, you've, you've written about way more than just dating. But I'm, I'm curious, how did you get your start? And what made you decide that you needed to write a book, your very first book? What got you into that? I, I can't say I decided that. It was decided for me. Um, it, so I am very hedonistic. Make no mistake. I was found on an airport tarmac at the age of four because when I wanted to go do something, mama went and did it. So I had an adventurous spirit my entire life. Um, and, and I've always been very hedonistic and in tune. Um, reading animals has always been a talent of mine. So, you know, when, when you were a kid and you would go to someone's house and they had a cat or a dog that was kind of afraid of people, mm -hmm. that was my best friend. I would go, my mission was to befriend that animal and gain their trust. And I always could. Mm -hmm. So I, I, there's, I'm very primal. I'm, I'm smiling because I feel that energy too. I, I was always the person that like, wow, my dog never likes anybody. I'm like, yeah, dogs, cats love me. I'm the, I'm the pet whisperer when I go over to friends' houses. Good coaches are very intuitive when it comes to behavior. Yeah. And it shows up in their childhood because these are people who can befriend animals that are afraid of other people. We intuitively know how to approach and gain trust because we read body language. 
And so good coaches are very good behaviorists and you'll see that throughout their trajectory. So I, the, you know, the universe has always kind of been feeding me my destiny. You know, I, I look back on my past and I see the stepping stones that brought me to where I am today. I'm a good coach and behaviorist. Well, that started when I was a child. I'm an author today. Well, that started when I was still a stripper and the voice in my head said, there's a book inside of you. And I had no idea five years down the road, I would switch from stripping to being a coach in life coaching, niching and dating and relationships, vomiting one book after another because the universe is just shoveling coal into the engine going, here you go. You have all this knowledge. Get it out there. And by the way, hurry up. And it was a freight train of energy from 2015 to like 2019, book after book after book. I was running in my house because the energy being pushed and propelled into me was beyond me myself. So I didn't decide to become an author. It was compelled into me. I, I can see that. Absolutely. Especially with the volume of, of information you've got in here. But there's so much to talk about when it comes to dating, relationships, intimacy, fixing our stuff. Fix your shit. It's also on yes. us. Yes. Absolutely. So, you know, of course, for me, being a relationship dating and sex coach, I would love to talk about your book, No More Assholes, because it is one that I have given to some of my clients. And I, you have it listed as your seven step guide to saying goodbye to guys and finding the real man you're looking for. And that is always what catches people's attention. So give me the lowdown, just the basics on your book, No More Assholes. So what we need to understand, and, and here's, here's how I, I understand this myself. I was a stripper for 20 years. I was in an environment where it's males and females, right? Mm-hmm. Interacting, interacting. So in the dressing room, it's me talking to the women. In on the floor, it's me talking to the men. So I had a lot of interactions with men and women, a lot of people being very honest about themselves. There's something that I say on my live streams, which is sometimes I get guys who are like, ah, oh, you don't know men, you know, you're not a man. Like, you can't speak for us. I'm like, dude, men don't go to therapists. They go to strippers and bartenders. <laughs> I know more about men than you do. I know more men than you've ever talked to. I sat on their laps and listened to what they said. And what I discovered, listen, I'm a sociologist. I study sociology, psychology, anthropology, biology, evolutionary psychology, behaviorism, and meditation because it changes everything. Mm -hmm. So with this brain in that environment, observing, I was in the field for 20 years. I know exactly what I'm talking about. I saw that there is a distinct difference between people who are equipped for a healthy relationship and people who are not. And the people who are not equipped for a healthy relationship have what I call a selfish short-term thinking mindset. Mm -hmm. I don't want to look after somebody. I want to be serviced. And I'm not thinking long-term. I'm thinking short-term gain. Somebody who's equipped for a long-term relationship is a generous long-term thinker. I want to look after somebody for the long-term. When you are in that mindset, you need a man. If you're a man, you need a woman. If you just want to play, you're in girl mode. I just want to have fun here today, God, tomorrow. Don't want to keep them. Go play with the guys. But there's guys who will lie about being a man. And so we use a no kissing for three months data rule to weed out the liars. I say, I'm tired of kissing people who are liars, cheaters, lazy, selfish, irresponsible. When people say, kiss whoever you want. I say, yeah, go kiss whoever you want. But listen, if I was looking for a hookup, I go get a hookup. Here today, gone tomorrow. Don't keep them inconsequential. They don't affect my mental and emotional well-being. The person I keep, very consequential. So I'm going to use a no kissing for three months data rule. Say, show me who you are first. If you're not who I'm looking for, and I know what I'm looking for because I read no more assholes and I defined, I defined who I'm looking for for a long-term relationship. And if you're not who I'm looking for, I'm just not going to select you. No time wasted, no tears shed. Of course, I'm sure one of the things that you get 
push back on the most about no more assholes is the no kissing for 90 days rule. And that is something that I actually have convinced a couple of clients, like, what's the harm in giving it a try? Because the way that you're dating right now isn't getting you the results that you want. So, but some of the pushback that I've talked a couple of these clients through has been the, well, I don't want to seem like a prude or, you know, how, how is someone supposed to hold out for that long? I'm like, it's literally explained in the book. Yeah. So, so let's, let's can I address it? Uh, I don't want to seem like a prude. So first of all, I shouldn't be basing my self-esteem on your opinion of me. Exactly. So what I seem like is irrelevant to me. And if you want to make an accusation that I'm a prude because I want to be conscientious about my choices, you're not going to call somebody a prude because they do a walkthrough in a house before buying it to make sure they like their layout. You don't call them a prude because they do a title search before handing their money over so they don't get scammed. You don't right. call them a prude because they did a home inspection to make sure it's not a money pit. So why is it when I want to make a conscientious decision about an important decision, by the way, the person I select to be my future husband, father of my child, person I'm going to buy property with, why do you make accusations in any way, shape, or form when all I'm doing is being logical? I want to know what I'm getting into before I get into it. That's logic. And nobody ever accuses you of being wrong for being logical unless it's a woman, unless it's a woman who's making a choice about who gets access to her body and exclusivity. Exactly. That's the thing that I've tried to help them understand that you don't owe access of your body to anyone else. And yes, you may want to kiss that guy so, so bad after that first date. But has it gotten you where you want thus far? And here's the thing. If I practice patience and impulse control, I'm more likely to get somebody who has patience and impulse control because like attracts like. And so I may want to kiss him the entire time. And girl, if you've read No More Assholes, you know about the slow dancing in the kitchen. I wanted to kiss that one, but I kept going, well, no, not the right date. And because I didn't kiss him, because I waited for the specific date, I ended up in the right relationship. I would have kissed him and started a relationship. Mm -hmm. And my husband, when he came back to fetch me, I would have said, sorry, buddy, you lost your chance. But I used to know kissing for three months dating rule. And because of that, I'm in the right relationship. That's the key. And I, I think that there's people out there who, I know you say that, okay, actually, kissing is an aphrodisiac. Right. Aphrodisiac amphetamine, antidepressant. And some of us deal with that a little bit better than others. So some of us don't deal well with it at all. And that is exactly the kind of client that I have said, look, forget everything else that society is saying to you. Read this and take it to heart. Like, I just want people to be able to have the freedom to get to know one another without attachment and without necessarily exclusivity so that they can see if they are truly a fit before there's like way too much emotional connection and way too much physical baggage and things like that. Uh, so yeah, I think that there's a lot of people right now who just aren't doing very well with modern dating because of some of the messages about how quickly we need or should get yes. physical with someone. Or, you know, I think too, when people are often on their second or third long-term relationship, it's really, really easy for folks to get into some of the habits that they had been in when they were in the long-term relationship. Like this, the making out really fast and then having sleepovers. And then all of a sudden, you've only known this person for a month and they're already meeting your children or they're sleeping in your home or you're sleeping in theirs consistently. Yeah. You don't know this person. Not at all. You know, the honeymoon stage version. Mm -hmm. You know, the best behavior syndrome version. Yes. Yes. And how long does best behavior syndrome usually last? Well, I like to point out corporations because people say, why three months? And I go, well, corporations don't want to waste money on people they should be firing. They don't want to waste their resources. And they know people do best behavior syndrome. 
They literally paid money to find out when should I get benefits. And they were told by professionals who study people that best behavior syndrome will last beyond two months. So wait until three. If there are actually people who are chronically late, actually people who are combative, actually people who have poor work ethic, you'll see that happen after two months. So they'll be on best behavior for two months, but then the reality of their patterns begin to seep through. And I like to say, you're not getting into a relationship with the presentation. You are going to be in a relationship with the reality of who the person is. So give them enough time to get comfortable and beyond the presentation. Like think, when are you going to let that fart make a noise? (laughs) The reality when you are more comfortable, because initially, listen, our bodies are in a chemical high. It's not even our choice to be in best behavior syndrome. I will be tired, but not grumpy. I will be close to menstruating, but not PMSing because I'm in a chemical high that puts me in an altered state. But what I didn't do by using no kissing for three months data is adding another chemical, which is the kiss chemical that adds an amphetamine, aphrodisiac and antidepressant to your altered chemical state. So I'm maintaining perspective by not introducing the kiss chemical. I'm making sure they respect me by creating space, no sleepovers, mm-hmm. no inclusivity. You're not allowed to control me, right? And so because we're doing it this way, like a corporation does, you don't get the benefits until you've shown me consistency. So if who you are in the beginning is true, then it doesn't change over 90 days. But if who you are was a facade, it will start to crack after two months. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody can keep up that good face for the short term. But if they are not who they say they are, they can't continue the fake behaviors for much longer. Everything will start bubbling to the surface. And that's why it's I I applaud some of my clients who are start trying to date more conscientiously they are looking for those generous long-term thinkers and they're willing to date this person for a few months but then they kind of kick themselves like my relationships only seem to last two to three months i'm like well let's let's try flipping your perspective your relationships didn't last six to eight months and crash and burn Right. Because that's what you were doing before is you were allowing yourself to get attached to people that didn't deserve your time or your energy or your effort because they weren't who they said they were. You are now dating more conscientiously, figuring out who they are sooner and realizing that there is not an alignment. This is not that person that I am looking for. And that is okay. Lesson release. Move on to the next. Yes. But then they get some shit from their friends. Or oh. too much, or you know, how come you haven't found someone to settle down with? And I'm just like, it's not one thing; it's another. Yeah, you're either dating the wrong person, or you're not settling down. Never good enough for everyone else. So guess what? Just gonna make yourself happy. I think a great answer to that is you don't have you you don't have to like it. I'm perfectly happy operating the way I am, and you don't have to like it. And I'm still okay operating the way I want to. Regardless of whether or not other people like it. Absolutely. Now, you did mention earlier how, of course, if if your mode is to want to just have some hookups, that is perfectly fine. Absolutely. But you got to be honest about it. So what would you say to people if they are single and they're not quite ready to commit yet? How, How do you recommend they... How do they be careful with other people's hearts is the big thing. Yes. Yeah. Because when you're in girl mode, don't mess with the men because you'll break their hearts because the men are looking for a relationship. Mm -hmm. And if you go play with a man and he gets emotionally invested and then you're gone because that wasn't what you wanted was to stay You're just as bad as the guy playing with the women and breaking their hearts. So you need to not only be clear about your intentions. And listen, as a woman, we can play willful ignorance too, can't we? We'll have a a friends with benefits, a situationship. And he's telling us from moment one, I don't want a relationship. 
And some girls, I can't say they're women, some girls will try to manipulate them. I'm going to keep throwing my body at him. Hopefully he's going to bond to me and change his mind. That's not okay. It's not okay. We hurt ourselves when we do that. So it's not okay for us to play with a man when we really should be playing with the guys. So not just communicating, I don't want a relationship. If you see this as a man, if you see this as a man, but he's maybe going to go through this with you to try and change your mind, don't play with him. What do you recommend that people try to distinguish the different? I mean, yes, we can wait the, the no kissing for 90 day rule. We can, you know, give them that the three months to really see is their consistency, you know, inspecting for what we expect because we already have done our list. We have figured out what we really want and need in a future partner. But yeah, how do we really distinguish if this person is here for the long haul and is that long-term thinker versus just that guy who's just here? Because as you say, some of them might try to keep the facade up as long as they can. Yeah. It's in their behaviors. It's, it's in, like, we don't take what people say at face value. So we go behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. We go talk to their people. If they're saying things to, to line up with you, to fool you, you know, oh, you know, like, I really want to make sure you understand. I'm really intent on getting into a committed long-term relationship. So I want to get married, have a kid, buy a house one day. And they're like, oh, yeah, me too. And you're like, you know, I'm using no kissing for three months date roll, no kissing, no sex, no sleepovers, no exclusivity, no hoping games. Um, and so you spend a couple months getting to know them. They're hanging out with you and all that. Uh, and, and you insist you're going to meet their people before you make a decision because you're not taking what they say at face value. They need to meet your people. So there'll be a little bit of grilling going on by your people because your people are looking for red flags that you might have missed. When you meet their people, there should be some grilling going on. Oh, it makes you think Tony's going to be a good dad one day. Tony, be a dad? Oh, did I just detect a lie? Mm -hmm. What well, makes you think Alan's going to make a good husband one day? Alan, get married? Ah, did I just detect a lie? Because aren't we open and honest about ourselves to the people we surround ourselves with, our inner circle? So probe in their inner circle to make sure reality is lining up with the words coming out of their mouths. Also take a look at their people, the satisfaction of their people. If this is a good person, their people are satisfied with their behaviors, with their choices. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a mistake I made with my second husband. I eloped after six months and then... Then the facade came crashing down, especially as I met his people. And his mother said to me, yeah, we just never thought that he'd get married. I was like, hey, what? Waving the red flag. <laughs> I was having some big regrets early on with that. I was, this was a time where, you know, I can reflect back and say that I wish that I had learned some more lessons and done some more introspection before getting into that long-term relationship because I was very much more in the mode of trying to find a new husband rather than trying to find a long-term partner. And there's a difference, right? There's, you know, sometimes if we are insecure, we're seeking people to accept us. When yeah. we are more confident, we're seeking the one we accept. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I can look back at that time and recognize that I should have been doing some more therapy. I did some, should have done more. Um, but, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I can't do anything about it now. And lessons were learned, you know. Uh, but here I am, 42. Actually, yesterday was my birthday. Happy birthday. Jim. Thank you. Just got married. Third time's a charm. And we do joke about that. So, but I'm... I'm grateful for some of the lessons that I learned, even if they were the hard way. Definitely wishing I had some of your books mm. before then. Get yeah. you stronger and smarter. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yes, in some ways, I am out here trying to coach others because of some of the lessons that I learned. I think many of us do get into coaching because we have some lessons to impart, but we're also 
coaches are, I think, natural gatherers of understanding other people's lessons, yeah. right? Observing others and seeing what they go through and seeing what works and what doesn't, things like that. Um, so with regards to comeback queen, yes. dating after divorce, that is something that I absolutely love helping people with because... I mean, half of all marriages do end in divorce. And while the numbers are not out yet, I'm sure that we saw a spike in 2020 and 2021. We just don't have the data yet. But dating after divorce is a big thing for a lot of people these days. But the dating does not seem to be going very well for people right now. All right, how, are, how are the dating apps for your clients these days? Because mine are not enjoying it. Right. Because there's so many guys, selfish, short-term thinkers who are using dating apps instead of professionals to get some touches. And so they've created a, a like a, it's like a, a, a coercion channel, right? Coercion channel. I'm going to go on dating apps. I'm going to convince a girl to show up for a dinner date. I'm going to insist on paying for the meal. And then I'm going to use that as a coercion tactic. Well, I paid for the meal. The least you can do is kiss me. And so we have women who are being used, taken advantage of, coerced by people who are using dating apps in nefarious ways. So dating apps are opportunities. I always say take all the opportunities that you can. But there's a way to use dating apps so that you are not giving those people the time of day. If you don't give them the time of day, you don't stress yourself out. And if you'll notice, all of my dating methodologies are about you not stressing yourself out. It's, not no fun. Fun. it's no fun. I like efficient. I like effective. Mama does not like to waste her time. So. Dating apps. Here's some advice for you guys. Don't drop off the dating apps. You don't have to. Just make them efficient and effective. So your first picture is you doing something you want to do with your prospective long-term partner. Do you want to go hiking? Do you want to go rowing? Do you want to go traveling? It's you doing that particular thing. Because guys who are looking for bodies are looking for bodies. If you're sexy, if it's just a sexy pose, he's like, maybe this body. And then he hops, he hops into your DMs and he's bugging you, sending you dick pics. So if your initial picture is you being purposeful, I want to be doing this with my future partner. The person who does that particular thing, going through pictures, looking for a relationship says, oh, I do that. And she's cute. Let's see what she's about. And then he goes and reads your profile. So your initial picture is you doing that thing. And then you add your cute pictures in there. Your profile needs to be descriptive and humorous because you want to create a smile. A smile crinkles up the lines right here. There's a reason why I don't do Botox anymore. And it's because I want to be happy. So when you crinkle these mm -hmm. laugh lines up here, yeah. those muscles send a signal to your brain that something pleasurable happens. Your brain releases dopamine. Dopamine is reward. So the man who saw your picture said, I like to do that, which she's about, read your profile felt a reward when he read your words. Now there's this connection that's happening. So then he writes you something. Now, how do you know who you should respond to? You should respond to the people who read your profile. Yes. If it's not obvious, that may be a copy paster who hasn't read a word you said. Yeah, I think that there's ways to um, have an effective opening line that are beyond the like, Hey, gorgeous, or what's up? You can't be brief and you can't, and don't address their looks. Always, yeah. always reference something in their profile. Yes. It's a missed opportunity if you aren't just taking five seconds. Like, hey, where was that photo taken? That mountain was beautiful. Looks like you enjoy rowing. Where's your favorite place to go? It's so simple. It's so easy. And the bots don't do it. Now, I know that more men deal with bots than women on a dating app. So it's just kind of how it goes. The scammers are both of them. 
right? The the men are, are getting um, people who are trying to scam money out of them, just like the women are getting people trying to scam money out of them. Absolutely. That, that we deal with people trying to scam our bodies too. Yes, 100%. Yeah, I think that the, the, the dating apps are ever evolving. You know, they are trying to always like change their features and do different things, but the basics will never change. Having great pictures, actually filling out your profile. And I think another great thing is always framing things in the positive. What do you want in that future partner? Not what you don't want. So if you're saying, here's the kind of person I'm looking for and here's who should swipe right, always frame it that way. Never tell people who you don't want to date. Yes. And it's just a bad tone. It's not the kind of tone you want to put out there. I, I do want to have a positive relationship. I've seen people say, well, I, I put the long list of knots and found somebody amazing. And so in every single thing that we talk about, it's there's there's always variations to it. Um, right. With the no kissing for three months, you know, there's people who will say, well, I kissed on the first day and we have an incredible relationship. It's like, yeah, I never discount look her intuition. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're, you know, listen, some people are leaving negative relationships, not looking for a negative person. So I'm aligned with you on the positivity. Um, I don't need to go into the list of negatives if I can put it out there what it is I want and simply avoid and circumvent what I don't want. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the very last thing that I do here on Keep Them Coming is ask Coach Kristen anything. And that is your chance to either just get my opinion on something. Uh, maybe you and your friends had a conversation about something. Or again, since I'm more in the sexology realm, if there is something that you would like to ask me about that, feel free. I, I love, I love what you talk about. I love your platform. I love how open and honest you are. Um, you know, I'm going to give you a, a common question that people have um, because, you know, this, this happens through things that I will coach sometimes. Um, and I know what my answer is and I know it's very much aligned with yours, but let's ask this question. If I have a low libido and my partner has a high libido, what should I do about that? The mismatched libido is one of the things that sexology is really designed to fix, but it is often pretty complicated because there's so many, by the time you get that far apart, there's so many emotions that can be tied into it. What I have found and what it's been, you know, how I have been trained is that oftentimes the person with the higher libido needs to come down and meet the person with the lower libido. Um, pull, like, trying to pull them up to you, it just probably isn't going to work. It can work for some, but honestly, like bringing it down and refocusing on the basics of intimacy. Intimacy begins outside of the bedroom. Intimacy has to be about way more than any form of penetrative intercourse or sexual activity. Mm -hmm. um, a clean kitchen is intimacy. Um, the care that we give our partner if they are ill, hey, I just went through a major surgery, like the intimacy that my partner built with me during that time, because I mean, he's having to pick me up and get me out of bed and basically weigh on me hand and foot for a couple of weeks. Like that is a very, very intimate thing to do for your partner, right? So it had me wanting to go back right to <laughs> doing things right away. I was not wanting to like wait and see. I was ready to rip his clothes off. Well, like intimacy has to be about building up something that, as you talked about earlier, that what's that foundation based on? Um, that foundation has to be based on communication. It has to be based on comfortably talking about your sex life. Where's the kisses? Where's the touch? Where's the romance? The things that you did to win over your partner are the things that you've got to do to keep them. So if, if you look back at the beginning of your relationship and you feel like it's very, very different than it is now, hey, we all change, we all grow, we evolve, we age, we have kids. There could be all sorts of reasons. But the fundamentals of what wooed your partner, if those are missing, mm -hmm. no wonder you're not having sex. Yeah. Can I touch no. on for a second yeah um because because there's two things that you said that are so important 
One is removing tit for tat or scorekeeping from a relationship and replacing that with an abundance of generosity. Mm -hmm. Because like you pointed out, you're so willing to give to your partner when you receive an abundance of generosity. And I'm the same way with my husband. Like I had, you know, I, I am at his service because he's at my service. And I will happily give him what he wants and needs because he so generously gives me what I want and need. And there's that abundance instead of scorekeeping. I'm, I'm like, wow, he's so good to me. How can I keep up? And in addition to that, making sure that intimacy is a daily occurrence, not a bedroom numbers game. So minimum two kisses a day, minimum five seconds each creates, like just think five seconds, right? If you were to just close your eyes and and imagine putting your lips against someone else and holding it there for, can I count this? Because it's it's so beautiful. Like when you just kind of get into that moment, one, two, three four, five. How do you not get butterflies when you do this a couple times a day with your partner? And so my husband and I might do it once a week, skipping a week here and there sometimes too, but that doesn't make us feel insecure about our relationship or our intimacy because every single day we are intimate. Yes. Yes. Same here. Absolutely. The, the intimacy has to be consistent day to day. And yes, it can vary slightly from couple to couple what intimacy looks like, but there are studies out there that show exactly what it takes to make sure that you have a healthy and abundant relationship and that you have a healthy and flourishing sex life. And if you're struggling with some of those things, that's what coaches like us are for and books like these are for. Now, the one last book that I wanted to touch base on before we do wrap up, I know I kind of act like we wrapped up, but Fix Your Shit because you have one for him as well. So tell us a little bit more about Fix Your Shit because that is more once you've been in the relationship and maybe you're finding that some of those little patterns are starting to creep in. Right. So it's Fix That Shit. That Shit. Yes. Thank you. The patterns that we talk about is our, maybe our patterns of insecurity maybe our patterns of ego and, and, and believing the ego instead of believing the truth. So an ego is easily recognized in what I call the whoosh. If somebody says something and you immediately feel a white hot heat, whoosh, of white hot heat, and the first thing you want to do is reject what they said. Usually that's your ego denying a truth. And so that would normally be the pattern of, I don't want to acknowledge this truth. I need to find how I'm right somehow in this because I don't want to say I'm wrong because the ego doesn't want to acknowledge wrong. It needs to be right. And let me tell you, I had no idea how much mental energy that was using up until I stopped doing it. And the moment I stopped doing that, I became light as a feather light as a feather um and and suddenly I had a superpower and I started writing books and books and books because I was no longer occupied trying to find my rightness so what fix that shit does is it teaches you how to be in control of your thoughts emotions and behaviors because when you get in control of that you stop vomiting into your relationship I want you to think about this If I throw up on your shoes, are you taking a step back? Right. So vomiting and overabundance of stress, fear, and anxiety, in addition to ego, is going to create distance. So when I take control of my ego, in other words, take responsibility for my thoughts, behaviors, and emotions, and I stop vomiting, now what I do is I start creating closeness. Because I create a space in our relationship that is emotionally safe. I've taken control of my thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. I take responsibility for myself and I've stopped vomiting on you. Now you start to feel safe being yourself because you don't feel like when you tell me a truth, I'm going to attack you. You don't feel like when you tell me your emotions, I'm going to negate you. 
And that right there, I feel is the second part to what you asked me. When there is a difference in libido, if increasing the intimacy doesn't do anything, it's most likely because one or both of you has some stuff you need to fix about your attitude, the way that you're showing up for the relationship. There are plenty of couples who really, they are best friends. They admire one another. The connection is really strong and they still have a mismatched libido. And for them, fixing the intimacy, increasing it, having more sex, it can be a, it could be a kick walk once it's just about fixing behaviors or being more intentional. Other half of those people need to go through some of the things you just mentioned, trying to understand how are they showing up for the relationship because simply kissing more or cuddling more or having a romantic date night once a week isn't enough. Yeah. And people need to know when it's time to work on some things a little bit more deeply. Well, in the last few minutes that we have here, I, of course, want you to tell the folks how they can find you, what's, what are the ways to get a hold of your books, all the things. Yes. I, I mean, I like to make it easy, right? So Canada's Dating Coach, Google is just going to show you page after page after page. Yeah. Because we has been busy since 2015, which is when I started this business. Uh, so just putting Canada's Dating Coach into a Google search will show you my YouTube channel, my podcast, um, my books on Amazon, my reviews. Uh, if you go to Amazon, your country's Amazon page, type my name into the search engine. Oh, Instagram, did I say Instagram? Uh, Chantel Hyde, C-H-A-N-T-A-L-H-E-I-D-E -E, into the Amazon search engine. We'll show all of my books listed. I have 10 books on dating and relationships. I have two awards in life coaching signed by our member of parliament. If you're in the U.S., that would be your Congress member. And I'm just, I'm out there. I'm out here like crazy TikTok. Come find me on TikTok. This is, this is where I kick it. I kick gas on TikTok because I love it. It's such, it's a platform that's so geared towards how I like to operate. So I have lots of fun on TikTok. TikTok is really, really where I put myself. I do live streams Monday to Friday. I, I'm a hedonistic. Like I said, I don't have a set start time, but I hop in between 10 and 11, 11.30 a.m. And then I'll be in until 1.30, 2 o'clock, Monday to Friday. Bonus times on weekends. Oh, this has been a fantastic conversation today. Thank you again so very much for being my guest on Keep Them Coming. And I wish you all the best in 2023 and beyond. You're fabulous. Let's keep up the great work. I would say all the same thing for you. I love and adore you. I love the work you're doing. I see you rising, my love. Yeah. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. I am trying to get my very first book done in 2023. So just gotta, you just got to keep going, right? Just keep writing. Just every day. Just get a Do little work done. Do you have a word count goal per day? I don't but it's time to set one. I think that's, I'm missing some goal setting with it. I Stephen king So yeah. I studied authors. I studied two authors, Stephen King and Anne Rice, because uh, I read a lot of their books. So uh, I studied their methodology. Stephen King does 5,000 words a day. So if you set yourself a daily word count goal and you say, I'm not done writing like every day, it, it make, give it, do it six days a week, five, six days a week. But every one of those days, you got to hit that word count, 2,000, 3,000, or 5,000 words. Just set yourself that goal and you're not done until you've moved that number up 2,000. I will do that. I will do that. Yeah. And you will be one of the first to read it. So I would I'll love I'll send you an advanced copy when it's ready. Love it. Thank you, my love. I appreciate you having me on so much. Thank you. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye, lovely. Bye-bye.